Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. I want to talk about intracanal instruments. These are the instruments that we use inside the root canal to clean and shape the canal so it's ready to be filled. Now, I'm not going to talk about the cleaning and shaping per se today. That will be covered in a later tape. I only want to talk about uh, what the instruments look like, uh, what the sizes are, uh, how they are used, and how they actually work. Now, the objective of this tape is that if you're handed any of the four instruments that I talk about today, uh, you'll be able to identify it by name, uh, tell what its diameter is, uh, describe how it works, and demonstrate in a tooth its proper use. Uh, I'm going to talk about K-type files, reamers, headstrom files, and barbed brooches. Now, the first I'm going to talk about is K-type files. Now, these are K-type files. This is the workhorse of endodontics. You do most of the work in endodontics with these files. Now, I'm showing you two. They're both the same length. They're different sizes, but the sizes are dependent upon the width. The sizes are given by the number of the file, and you can always find the number of a file on the plastic handle, the end of the file. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but there's a number on this file. This is a number 30 file. The files range from a number 10 to a 140 file. Now, to talk about the detail of the files, we want to go to the artist representation. Since files are so small, we can't really see them too well. You can see here we have a file, and it's 25 millimeters from the handle to the very tip of the file. If it's cut right here and turned sideways, you could see a cross section of the file, and you can see that it's square. A file is made by taking a square tapered piece of steel, stainless steel, uh, shaped pretty much the way the Washington Monument is shaped. And then it's twisted. And as it's twisted, you get a spiraling effect, which creates cutting flutes along the side. It's 25 millimeters, once again, from the tip to the hub. The, s the spirals, or the cutting part of the file, are 16 millimeters from the first flute to the end flute. At the first flute, the diameter of the file is labeled D1. Now, the size of the file, or the number of the file, is actually the diameter of the file at D1 in one hundredths of a millimeter. For example, a number 10 file is 10 hundredths of a millimeter at D1. A 15 file is 15 hundredths of a millimeter at D1. A 40 file would be 40 hundredths of a millimeter. 16 millimeters up the shaft, the flutes end. The cutting part of the file ends. That is called D2. And that is always 30 hundredths or 3 tenths of a millimeter larger than D1. Remember, the tip to the handle in a standard K-type file is 25 millimeters. D1 to D2 is 16 millimeters. D1, which is also the, the number of the file, is in one hundredths of a millimeter. And D2 equals D1 plus 30 hundredths of a millimeter. Now, all of this is for standard K-type files. Uh, larger and smaller files are also made. Uh, the larger ones are for uh, very long teeth. The smaller ones are for teeth where you have limited access, like second molars. Uh, and also, files are made uh, with longer handles. But uh, the K standard 25 millimeter K-type file will be 99 percent, or will handle 99 percent of the teeth that you'll be working on. So much for the size of the files. Let me show you how they actually work. Now, a file is uh, very much the same. The instrument file is very much the same as a common file, which is why it's called a file. In that, uh, in a common file, there are no real sharp edges. 
The file uh, is, just has ridges and works predominantly by drawing the ridges with pressure across the surface of what you want to cut. And you're actually wearing away at the surface of uh, the thing that you're cutting through. Now, an endodontic file works exactly the same way in that you have to, if you just let it float over, there are no sharp edges to cut. You actually have to apply pressure, and when you do that, you can cut with the file. So it cuts with friction and pressure. Now let me show you how a file is used in a tooth. Here we have a tooth that we know the length of, that we've determined you know, on, a, on a previous tape. Uh, the file is curved because uh, with small files, you always curve, be, curve the file before you go into the tooth. And the tooth has been lubricated with sodium hypochlorite. We enter into the access and work the file down the tooth, kind of rotating it, never more than a quarter of a turn. You're not screwing the file in. You're wor working the file down to your known length. Once the stop indicates that you're at the proper length, you press the file against the side, any side of the canal, and withdraw. That's the pressure and the friction. You work the file down again to your proper length, press it against another side, and withdraw. And you keep on doing that, working down to your length, pressing against a different side, withdrawing all the way around the canal until the file is very, very loose in the canal withdraw, each time going down to your full length, pressing against this time the labial and withdrawing until, as I mentioned before, the file is very loose. Then you go on to your next file, which should go all the way to place, and you work it exactly the same way. Now, if your next size larger doesn't go all the way down, return to the size that you have been working at and file some more until it's so loose that uh, the next size file will go all the way to place, and then you can file with that. Remember, always file with a pull stroke. If you use a push stroke, you may force debris down through the apex. Never turn the file more than a quarter turn. We're not screwing the file into the tooth. You want to just work it on down. And remember that the cu uh, file cuts by pressure and friction. So you have to press it against the side of the canal. Now, there, there are two common errors that we uh, see that students often make, and I want to point them out with the hope that you'll avoid them. The first is that when you're working the file, when students work the file down the canal, sometimes they actually rotate the file with the effort of trying to screw it into the tooth. Now, the reason that that'll get you in trouble are the files, since they've been twisted, are very weak when you twist them or in a circular motion. And if it binds in the canal, it can break off very easily. So be very careful. Don't rotate a file like this. Don't turn it. It's not a screw. It's a file, and it works in a back and forth, not a circular motion. It doesn't cut well that way. The second error that uh, we see is that uh, when, when students are filing, often they file very passively, back and forth, almost you know, in a very monotonous, not really thinking about what they're doing. And hopefully you can see that there's a difference between doing that, working it down to the length, pressing, and withdrawing, so that you're actually doing some cutting. Pressing and withdrawing. It's different than just a back and forth. Now, as a review of what we've just gone over, I want to ask some questions. You can just answer them on a piece of paper and check yourself to see whether you've understood what we were talking about. First thing is, how long in millimeters is a standard K-type file? Hopefully you said 25 millimeters. If you cut the file in cross-section, what, what is the shape of a standard K-type file? It's square. If a K-type file is a size of 100, what is D1 and D2? 
D1 would be 100 one hundredths of a millimeter, or one millimeter. D2 would be 130 hundredths, or 1.3 millimeters. And what are the two most common errors that students make? They're trying to screw the file into the tooth and filing very passively, kind of stabbing the tooth, not thinking about what they're doing in terms of applying pressure. Now, if you got these questions, that's fine. If not, review this material on your handout. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about reamers. This is a reamer, as you can see. It looks very much like a file. I don't want to say very much about them. Uh, we don't issue you reamers or use them here in the clinic, but I do want to just mention it so that when you see the term, you'll know what they're talking about. Now, once again, let's go to the artist's representation to see the detail. It's shaped very much like a file. The length is, once again, 25 millimeters, and it's standardized in terms um, of 10 to 140, just like a standard K-type file. The only major difference between a reamer and a file is its construction, in that if it's cut right here, you can see over here in a cross section that a reamer is actually a triangular piece of metal that's been twisted instead of a square piece of metal, which a file is. As a result, you have less cutting flutes along the surface, which gives you a more efficient pathfinder to locate and negotiate canals. But in, uh, in trade-off, you get a less efficient cutting instrument. So that's the major difference between a file and a reamer. A file is square in cross-section and has more flutes. A reamer is triangular in cross-section and has less flutes. The D1, once again, is, uh, is in a hundred, hundreds of millimeters, just like a standard file. Uh, D2 is, once again, just the same. It's 16 millimeters up the file. And the use is pretty much the same. So the only difference is the cross-section. This is a Hedstrom file. As you can see, it's quite a bit different than a K-type file or a reamer. I want to go to the artist's representation, and I'll point out the differences. The K-type file and the reamer were square and triangular pieces of metal that were twisted to produce cutting flutes. As you can see here in the cross section, a Hedstrom file is actually round. It's a round, tapered piece of stainless steel out of which areas, triangular areas, have been gouged to produce triangular cutting flutes that cut very aggressively on the pull direction. Other than this difference, uh, the standardization and the, and the length are exactly the same as the two previous instruments in that they're 25 millimeters long from the tip to uh, the handle and uh, the cutting part is 16 millimeters long. Now, the Hedstrom file is more like a screw in configuration than an actual file. So I want to show you how that works. Um, whereas a file really didn't have any rough and sharp edges, uh, the Hedstrom file actually does. Much like a screw, it has actually ridges that can dig in and uh, can cut very aggressively. So on the pull st push stroke, it slides along fairly easily, but when you dig in, it really can cut very aggressively and very efficiently on the pull stroke. You can also see that if you put too much pressure with these ridges sticking out, it has a tendency to bind. So you have to be careful and not use too much pressure with this instrument, but just kind of draw it across and those edges will cut. Let me show you the file and how it actually works in the same direction. You push, there's no resistance, but when you pull, you can really cut a trough very quickly with this instrument. It is the most aggressive cutting instrument we have, so it has to be used with care. Now let me show you uh, how the instrument is used in a tooth. Since it's such an aggressive instrument, there are several differences between the standard type file. 
First of all, we only issue you larger size files, and that's because we want you to use these files only in large canals that are very straight, usually anteriors of young patients. That's because it has a tendency, the file has a tendency to bind on the pull direction, which, uh, you know, and if you use it in a narrow canal, you just increase the risk of it binding in the canal. The second thing is when you insert the file into the canal, you put it straight on down. You never rotate it because since the file is like a screw, if you rotate it, you have a tendency to screw the file into the dentin walls and then it'll bind and then you'll never get it out. So you push it straight on down. If it doesn't go all the way to place to the proper length, then you shouldn't be using it. It should be the kind of a canal where it can go readily to place and then you just press against the walls but not too firmly or else you'll bind and just withdraw. Never rotate in all directions. And by doing that with this file in wide open canals, you can really flare the canals and instrument them very quickly. A few quick questions on a headstrom file to make sure you got the point. First of all, how long is the headstrom file from uh, the tip to the handle? Once again, just like other instruments, it's 25 millimeters long. In cross-section, what does the headstrom file look like? It's a circular cross-section, not triangular or square like a reamer or a file. And finally, what kind of canals do you use a headstrom file in? You'd use it only in large, straight canals, never in a narrow canal. This is a barbed brooch. It's used to remove uh, soft tissue, cotton, or paper points from the root canals. We don't actually do any instrumenting of the canals, per se. On the artist's representation, we can see the detail of this instrument. Uh, it's a cylindrical piece of stainless steel out of, uh, into which notches have been made. And they produce sharp barbs that project out from uh, the main shaft of the instrument. Uh, you can see that it's round in cross-section, and this just shows in greater detail what those barbs are, and they come out in all directions. Uh, this produces a situation much like a harpoon where it can enter soft tissue very easily, but then on the withdraw, it, uh, the soft tissue gets caught along these barbs and is withdrawn from the canal. Let me demonstrate how this works. As you can see, the brooch enters the cotton very easily, and on withdraw, the cotton gets twined in the barbs and is withdrawn. In a tooth, the bar brooch works in exactly the same way. You insert it into the canal, keeping away from the dentin walls because you only want to get soft tissue. Turn slightly, and as you withdraw, you can pull soft tissue out. Now, the design of this instrument is somewhat limited in that the, bro uh, the barbs are very soft, and if you put it too far down the canal, they can bend towards the shaft of the instrument, or if you use it in a narrow canal, they can bend towards the shaft of the instrument. Then when you try and pull it out, instead of getting against soft tissue, it'll bind into the hard dentin wall. And you'll have trouble getting it out. So you never use this instrument in a narrow canal. You always use it in a large canal. And you always stay away from the dentin walls. Just use it in soft tissue. If one of the barbs gets caught in a dentin wall, uh, it might break off from the shaft of the barb brooch, and as a result, uh, you'll have a difficult, difficult time negotiating that canal with a file. Or if quite a few barbs are caught in a dentin wall, in the dentin walls of the canal, uh, then the whole instrument may snap off in the canal, and then you've got real problems. It's, you're almost guaranteed a failure on that tooth. So only use them in large canals, and if you have any question as to whether a bar brooch will fit in a canal, don't use it. It's not that important to use, uh, and you can get into a lot of trouble with them. 
We've talked about K-type files, reamers, Hedstrom files, and barbed brooches. If you have any questions about the material that we've presented, ask an instructor or see the handout on this videotape. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.